Welcome to the Financial Administration class. Today we're going to talk about Lecture 1, which covers Chapter 1 of the Eckert and Brigham textbook. This chapter provi provides an overview of financial management. Main topics in this chapter include different forms of business organizations, objectives of the firm, determinants of the fundamental value of a company, and we'll also talk about some basics of financial securities, financial markets, and financial institutions. After studying this chapter, you are also required to read the Jinzheim case from the BES casebook. I'll list some discussion questions from this case and also some discuss qu discussion questions from Chapter 1 and uh, put these questions on the discussion board on D2L. So you are encouraged to post your opinions or your ideas uh, on the discussion board. We say corporate finance is important to all managers. Of course, not everybody plans to specialize in the finance area or become a finance manager. However, having some understandings in corporate finance and financial management is very important to all MBA students and all managers in the company. Corporate finance provides the skills managers need to identify and select the corporate strategies and individual projects that can add value to their company. Also the skills to forecast and the funding requirement of their company and devise strategies to acquire or obtain those funds. Since this class is about financial management in the business, let's start by looking at different types of business organizations. Usually we talk about sole proprietorship and partnership and then corporations. We'll discuss the advantages and disadvantages of each type in the next few slides. Imagine you start your business as a proprietorship. Then you are your own boss and you are the only owner. You are facing some advantages. For example, it's fairly easy to form the business and you are subject to fewer regulations. In addition, your business or say your company is not subject to corporate income taxes. The income or profit you make is actually subject to your personal income tax. However, you are also facing some disadvantages. For example, the business has somehow limited life. Usually it depends on the lifespan of the owner or how long the owner decides or wants to keep the business. Also, the business is subject to unlimited liability, which means if the business is not doing so well, then it's very difficult for the owner to pay off the debt and uh, the owner may actually have to lose, for example, your own car or your own house uh, just to pay off the debt. In addition, usually for a small business, it's difficult to raise capital to support the survival and growth of the business. You may also want to start as a partnership or maybe your sole proprietorship business later grows into a partnership. A partnership has roughly the same advantages and disadvantages as a sole proprietorship. Your business may eventually grow into a corporation, or you can incorporate a business from the very beginning. A corporation is a legal entity separate from its owners and managers. You, you will have to file papers of incorporation with state, with charters and bylaws. The advantages of a corporation include unlimited life, easy transfer of ownership, limited liability, and ease of raising capital. The disadvantages include double taxation and cost of setup and report filing. Now let's try to have some discussions about these. I want you to try to explain in your own language about the following features of a corporation. Easy transfer of ownership. How easy is it? What do you have to do to transfer the ownership? When it comes to the limited liability, li it is limited in which way? When we talk about ease of raising capital, 
How easy is it? Can you list some ways of raising capital for a corporation? And when we talk about double taxation, what does it mean? And it's doubled how? And uh, when we talk about cost of setup and report filing, first of all, this is reporting to who? And why is it costly? So I want you to think about these questions and try to post your answers on the discussion board and check out the discussion board and see what your classmates think about these questions. Keep in mind that not all corporations are public corporations. A public corporation can sell its securities, including stocks or bonds, to the general public, typically through a stock exchange or through the over-the-counter OTC market. Public companies must be listed on the stock exchange, such as the NYSE or the NASDAQ. To become a public company, a business needs to go through the initial public offering or say the IPO of its stocks. IPO will help to raise cash and allow founders and pre-IPO investors to harvest some of their wealth. After becoming a public company, the company can subsequently issue more debt and equity. Philosopher, diplomat, educator, president of Columbia University and Nobel Prize laureate Nicholas Murray Butler once famously said the limited liability corporation was the greatest invention of modern times, exceeding steam and electricity. However, the design of corporations has its defects. Because of the separation of ownership and control of the company, a, corpor a corporation is subject to the agency problem, which means managers may act in their own interest and not on behalf of the owners or say the shareholders. Corporate governance can help to control agency problems. Corporate governance refers to the set of rules that control a company's behavior toward its directors, managers, employees, shareholders, creditors, customers, competitors, and community. Management's primary objective should be shareholder wealth maximization, which translates to maximizing the fundamental value of the stock, or say the fundamental stock price. This, of course, brings up a lot of other questions or discussions. For example, should firms then behave ethically? The answer is, of course, yes. And do firms have any responsibilities to society at large? And the answer is also yes. Shareholders are also members of a society. So maximizing shareholder value or say shareholder wealth is not contradicting with the goal of um, social responsibilities. Maximizing stock price is actually good for society, employees, and customers. There are studies that show that employment growth is higher in firms that try to maximize stock price. In addition, consumer welfare is higher in capitalist free market economies than in co communist or so socialist economies. Fortune magazine lists the most admired firms. In addition to high stock returns, these firms generally have high quality from consumers review or in and employees who like working there. We just established the idea that managers are supposed to work hard to maximize shareholder wealth or say stock value. What factors would matter to the value of a company's stock or say the value of the company? From a valuation point of view, we say there are three main factors. To understand that, think about the following principles. First, are the things equal? You would always prefer 1,000 to 100. So in other words, any asset that could offer you higher amount of cash flows would be valued higher. Second, you also would prefer receiving $1,000 today to having to wait till next year to get the same amount of $1,000. This tells you that any asset that could give you cash flows earlier would be valued higher. Lastly, assets with lower risks are usually more valuable than risky assets. To summarize, for an asset, 
be it a stock, a bond, a new product line, or a company. Its value is generally determined by the following three factors. Amount of expected cash flows. We say the more is better. Timing of the cash flow stream. The earlier or say sooner is better. Risk of the cash flows. Less risk is generally better. This course is essentially a study about how these factors can affect the value of a company and its stocks. And how can we improve the value of a company by looking at these three factors? In the next few slides, we provide some brief explanation about these factors and the valuation process. More details will be explained in the later chapters and later lectures. First, we want to understand how much free cash flow the company is expected to generate in the future. Free cash flows are the cash flows that are available or say free for distribution to all investors, including stockholders and creditors. It equals to the sales revenue minus operating cost and then minus operating taxes and then minus the required investment in operating capital. You don't have to worry about the calculation at this point. We will go over this in details in Chapter 2. The weighted average cost of capital, or say the VAC, is used to measure how risky this company is. VAC is the average rate of return required by all of the company's investors. When investors provide capital to a company, they, of course, want returns. For the company, that means cost of raising these capital. In simple English, there is no free money. It always comes with a cost. VAC is affected by the company's capital structure, the market interest rate, the risk of the company, the investor's overall attitude toward risk. And the general idea is, the more risky your investors think you are, the more costly it will be for you to raise money from your investors. The details of the VAC will be discussed in Chapter 2. A company's fundamental value, or intrinsic value, is the sum of all the future expected free cash flows, discounted by the VAC, to be converted into today's dollars. And this is captured in this formula here in this slide. Notice in this formula, the discounting process deals with the timing factor of the cash flows, or say when these cash flows are ex expected to be made or received. Let's take a look at the diagram on the next slide to see the big picture about value or say valuation.